With our five Emoka teams all blasting south towards the equator, nowhere to shower and clean yourself on board except braving the spray flinging across the bow. Welcome to the Ocean Race Show, where it's all about setting yourself up for the best possible crossing of the infamous doldrums. But before we get into any of that, let's wind the clock back and take a look at where our boats were when we left them after Friday's show. The jibing battle heading southwest resulted in those boats that packed a downwind spinnaker looking good, Biotherm. 11th Hour Racing Team and Team Holson PRB to the west, with Guyo Environment Team Europe out to the east and with the risk of being too east when entering the doldrums. The boat struggling to stay in touch seemed to be Team Militia, some miles to the north and significantly slower than the others. Very frustrating for us because uh, you know we spent two days trying absolutely everything and trying to play with different settings, different sails, and you know the worst thing or the most towering thing is when you're going slower than the others because you're never satisfied then. You're always trying to, to work out in your head what to do next. And so um, so uh, yeah, no, we haven't managed to sleep much, but now we think we've had a bit more of a speed mode. And I can feel the the relief of that coming off because uh, I'm sleeping very deeply at the moment. Um, I don't think I'm sleeping so well at first, but um, yeah, no, happy to find a bit more speed now. And now we've got to try and work out how to catch back up with the others. Now, to give you an idea of what it's actually like on the Amoka, we actually had to edit that clip. We had to filter out the whine of the hydrofoil. So while I get ourselves into race control, have a listen to that clip again without the filtering on. That makes quite a big difference. It can be up to 20% 20, 20 speed difference sometimes we saw. And, um... That makes quite a big difference. It can be up to 20% 20, 20 speed difference sometimes we saw. And, um... So Team Militia finding some speed and beginning to regain touch with the leaders. But everybody, as the doldrums was approaching, was on their guard against slowing down. This is the view from 11th Hour Racing Team's mast camera as they avoid the large patches of seaweeds on the racetrack, while Team Holson PRB are just up ahead. We've got a lot of weed. I guess it's um, lots and lots of it, so the whole deck's covered in it. When we're going really fast, it's alright because you sort of cut through it, it sort of breaks up into quite small parts. But when you're slow, it uh, fills up all the appendages and we have quite a time getting it all off. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty, there's plenty over there. All the boats suffered with the seaweed, and not just with boat speed, the hydro generators powering the electronics on board the boat took a battering too. So, last night, one of those blades broke. Now we have the leftover part stuck in the head of the hydro. Luckily we have enough spare parts so the other the hydro is running again, but now we have to drill a hole in the middle, put a screw in and pull out the broken part. Ooh. Voila! Running into seaweed will slow you down and it could lose you places in this race, but it could also be something a lot more serious, as Biotherm discovered striking a fishing net in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, yes, we touch the net. Uh, it seems we don't have anything in the keel because we are still uh, very fast, but uh, we, we send a mail to the organization to let the others know that, that uh, there is something here in the middle of the sea. A quick check under the water didn't reveal any damage or anything hanging onto the keel, slowing the boat down. So with speeds around 18 knots, they pushed on south. Well, the issues didn't stop there for Biotherm. And we noticed something in the background of one of the feeds that they sent us. But before I go into it, a little bit of background information. So on board our mockers, we have four sailors and then one onboard reporter. Out of those four sailors, because the boat is racing 24 hours a day, including at night, two of those sailors will be rotated out to get maybe one, two hours sleep in carefully choreographed slots. So that leaves two people on deck working the boat hard. Now they do have an extra pair of hands, an autopilot. And the autopilot system has evolved a long way since those first explorers used them in the 1960s. It's no longer just a wind vane on the back of the rudder. It's now an electronic system, but it still uses 
basic information, either heading on ship's compass or wind angle. And take a look at what happens here for Biotherm. So it's windy and their OBR on board questions why, if it is so windy, why are they using their big sails? Cool main, big spinnaker. Uh, but uh, the wind uh, sensor is, is, not, is not telling the truth. Probably more uh, 18, 20 knots. This is really serious. This is not just a case of your wind data being inaccurate. That information shows that somewhere in the calculations, there's an error, there is a mistake. And if one number is out, all of your numbers could be out. And the pilot is using those numbers to decide whether it should go straight or whether it should turn. And just look what happens next here. Watch the moon in the window behind Paul Mayer's head as the pilot suddenly, wildly, just swings the boat up through 30 degrees. As the boat swings up and that wind angle changes, then Paul has to do this enormous ease on the sheet for the forward sail to keep the boat, well, a little bit more under control. Now, if indeed this is a problem with their wind sensor and that screwy data is feeding through into their pilot and they don't manage to fix it, by the time they get to Cape Town, we're going to have some very tired sailors on board Biotherm. Just behind Biotherm was Team Holson PRB, and they knew that the tactical game was soon going to be coming to an end, and that it was all about the positioning into the doldrums. Next jive, straight to the doldrums. Consequences, if you, if you jive too early, you can't uh, choose anymore uh, the, the, the place uh, you will cross uh, the doldrums. So usually it's a easier to be a bit more west than being to, to east. So Kevin Escoffier looked happy about how they were lining up for the doldrums and if west is best, Biotherm and 11th hour racing team certainly are set to gain too. I think we're in a fleet-wise in a good place, sort of the most western boat, so i um, pretty happy with that. And it's going to be a lottery, well not a lottery, but it's going to be a full restart in the doldrums anyway. So. Um, just get there in one piece and stay in touch and then try and manage that well. It's going to be cloud hopping and, and uh, yeah, sail changes and all sorts of pain and films. Google Environment Team Europe have been unable to get to the favourable side. If Robert Stanjic and crew are going to take the lead, the doldrums will have to be weaker than expected. Where you enter the doldrums is going to be crucial as to how you finish this leg. And the rule of thumb is that you should enter it as far west as possible, where the doldrums are thinner, so you spend more time in better breeze. But the question is how far west to go. We'll just take a look here on the agony on the faces of the crew from Team Holson PRB as they debate putting in one more jibe that might lead them to a better position, but would mean a risky split from the fleet. Well, we've just got a massive left shift and we have done all day and we've been waiting for it to go right the whole day and it's just not going right so we're being dragged further and further east in the doldrums which is where all the books say you shouldn't go. Yeah, we, are, we are playing but I think we are going in the zone where nothing... I mean we could do um, half an hour that way and if no one follows us come back. And very close to it, yes. For me, it's still VMG. Huh? For me, it's still full VMG. Yeah. I think we will wake up Tom and we will uh, discuss that. No. I think yes. If I were alone, I uh, I do it. You can lose more by driving, but you can uh, win a uh, lot, a lot of sports. Try a quick one to see the angle we've got on the other side. Is it too risky or not? We'll see. The future only will uh, we'll know. After they decided to jibe, all eyes were glued to the horizon. We think that 11th hour has um, followed our jibe. 
Right. I shouldn't be uh, stressed by that. It's a game. It's a game. Well, an important one. <laughs> well, no. An important game made just perhaps the slightest bit easier because there is one certainty that the wind is going to get light. Very light indeed. This doesn't mean a rest though. A change of conditions means you need to adapt and trim of the boat must be adjusted. 100 kilos of gear shifted from the stern to the bow to rebalance the boat to glide better through the calm seas. There is still some tricky navigation to be done, but this time it's on a very local level with large Atlantic forecasting models swapped out for local satellite images of the clouds. Yeah, it's going to be a busy few days. Let's go through the sad images. Not had a nice visible one yet this morning to see really, you know, where all the convection is, but uh, at least the IR satellites give you an idea of sort of where the, where the big cloud lines are and the boundaries are. And, you know, the big features that might be driving these local winds because everything suddenly gets very local around here. So yeah, learning to do in the next few days. <laughs> Just keep scrapping away and hopefully we can uh, get south a little bit faster than everyone else and uh, out the other side. <laughs> Less wind and also more heat will be the story of the next few days. Soon our boats will be turning into ovens. Anything that can be unlocked and let some air into the boat is opened up. What is a great design to keep you protected in the Southern Ocean from the waves and the cold doesn't quite fit the conditions of the equator. When was the last time you had a good sleep? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's pretty nervous about trying to work out what the breeze is going to be doing and why. Why is the doldrums so tricky? Well, I'll let Will Harris explain. So the doldrums is basically, it's a convergence of the two um, atmospheric cells. And what you have is you have this circulation of the air and there's basically a zone in the middle of uh, the earth where the air is lifting up, it's rising up and then you get very complicated winds here because when the air rises, it forms clouds and uh, and this means it's extremely chaotic, which means you can't predict at all what the wind is going to do. The forecasts are, are very wrong often, and so we have to cross this to get into the new winds on the other side. Um, but crossing is the hard bit, knowing where to cross, how far to the east or west, and, and also what, what cards it will give you, if it will give you more wind or less wind. But, um, yeah, the doldrums is a, a tricky place. Everyone's speed has slowed as the teams hit the wall of light winds, almost drifting on the seas. How long will the doldrums hold back our boat's progress south? But amazingly, one boat doesn't seem to be suffering, or at least not suffering as hard. Guyo Environment Team Europe to the east in the position that nobody thought was sensible is in fact making gains. In fact, they have actually taken the lead. The breeze that was there waiting for them might not have been on any of the charts, but they have made full use of it. And if Robert Stanjek and crew can keep this progress going, they might come out of the doldrums firmly ahead. We will be back for another Ocean Race show in two days time. And we would like to hear from you either in the comments below or you can email us directly questions at theoceanrace.com. We're very lucky here that, well, I've got access to some pretty important experts both in the race and watching from shore. So if there's anything that you want explained, examined or discussed by those in the know, let us, let us know what it is. The VO65s won't be racing with us again until we get to Aarhus, but there's no reason that we can't check in with them. So whatever it is, anything you want to know about the race, the sailors and what makes this event happen, let us know and we'll see you Wednesday.